Good morning. I'm not sure how today's going to go. Um, I'm not normally nervous, and I'm shaking a bit. So <laughs> I just feel like, um, how many of you guys, as, as you've been reading Awe of God and, and really just diving in, you've just found that you really know nothing? Yeah. Yep. And I feel like I just keep getting deeper into that place where I'm like, Lord, when's it going to stop? <laughs> like, um, but I hope it never does, because I think, I think that's kind of the point, is that he is God and we are not. And he knows what he's doing. Um, I have a lot of props this morning, um, and that can always be really fun. So you can pray for, for <laughs> that all to work out. I also forgot my water, so I had to take Cody's um, with Teddy Roosevelt. So <laughs> I apologize. I have a little bit of a, a cough left over. I'm going to start this morning in <clears throat> the book of James, chapter th- 4, verses 13 and 14. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. really encourage you guys to like, have physical Bibles and open them and use them. Um, There's just really something powerful because his word is alive and active, right? So we have to remember, Sandy was talking about that Wednesday, too. It's like, this is a living word. (laughs) His word is powerful. So as we read it, let's just ask Holy Spirit just to, to share with us what he wants to share. It says, look here, you who say... Today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town, and we will stay there for a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It is here a little while, and then it is gone. And some of you who are following along in the series know that this is one of the scriptures that was brought up last week or this coming week, depending on where you are. And, and this verse has always hit me, you know? It's like we get so fixated, so focused on this life and what we're doing and what, we're, you know, what, what life we're building and, and the things that we have to do tomorrow. And I know I can get so overwhelmed by even just my today's checklist of how much there is to do, right? We can get so focused on this life, and yet this verse says it's like a morning fog. It's like a, a mist. Like if I were to just spray a little mist right now and then it's gone, that's what this life, your you know, 60, 70, 80, 80, 90 years of life, or 120 as Cody's going for, um, that is what your life is like compared to eternity. It is a vapor. It's a mist. It's a fog. It's, it's here, and then it's gone. And we can get so focused on what we're doing here in the temporary, what our lives look like, what we're building, and yet God says it's nothing compared to the, ex- I mean, eternity is eternity. It's forever, right? And so no matter how long, no matter what you accomplish in this life, no matter what you do, no matter how many years you live, it is but nothing (laughs) compared to eternity. And and I think (coughs) the trap can be to be Focus, so focused on the, the temporary, like I'm saying. But then also sometimes as Christians, we can hear this verse and we can say, okay, well then forget all this life. Let's just focus on eternity, right? Let's just focus on, on what we're gonna, where we're going to be, right? We, we get our ticket into heaven and let's go. And we can kind of neglect this life thinking, well, now we're just going to focus on eternity because that's where we're headed, right? Let's just do whatever we can to separate ourselves from whoever we can in order to keep ourselves pure so that we can get into eternity, right? So that we can just like by the skin of our teeth get there because <laughs> this life is crazy, right? And, and that's another trap is that we get so fixated. My dad used to say we're so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, right? <laughs> We are supposed to, though, make today count for eternity. And, and this is where, the, where this really goes. Is like, And he didn't take a deep dive into this, but I want to take a little bit more. Is, is actually, yes, this life is but a vapor. It's so quick. It's nothing. It's so tiny compared to eternity. And yet, what we do in this life literally changes everything for eternity. 
And I don't just mean because, you know, a lot of us then can limit that also to, okay, well, as long as I make my decision for Jesus, well, then, yes, that's how it changes eternity. Yes, that's true. And that is really, really, really important. Give your life to Jesus and it will change where you spend eternal life, right? But it's even more than that. What you do with this life, the decisions you make, the kind of person you choose to be, how much you give yourself over to him, how much you make your decisions based on what God is saying actually changes not only whether you get in or not into heaven, but actually what you do there. I love how, you know, we were talking about how life, I mean, eternity, a lot of people think, oh, we're sitting on clouds and, you know, just playing harps. No, we're not. <laughs> the word says we are to rule and reign with Christ. The word says that we are going to judge angels. Figure that one out. The, the word says that, that's, that like his government has no end, right? The universe is ever expanding. So who knows what we'll be doing? It, I, you think about those scriptures where it talks about the, um, the servants and depending on what they do with what they're given, they're actually given charge over cities. I think that has to do with eternity, that what we do with what little we're given here, actually, not only will it, will it increase what God is able to trust us with here in this life, but it actually will reflect on what we do, the position we hold in eternity. Now, let me quickly say to you that the person, I don't know if there are sewers in heaven, but if, the person, if there were, the person who's like in charge of the sewer system in heaven is still way better than a king in hell. So, so yes, right? Yes. So yes, w the, the, the main thing is give your life to Jesus. <laughs> the main thing is surrender yourself to him so that you can have this reconciled relationship, not just to escape hell though, but because he's good, because he's worth it, because he cares for you, because he created you and he knows what's best for you. But I don't know about you guys, but I want that when I get to the gates. He doesn't just go, oh man, you barely made it. <laughs> and instead he goes, well done. Let me place you over this. Let me have you be part of creating. The scripture that John Revere then brought up is 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. I'm going to read it to you in the uh, New Living Translation. It says, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. So this is Paul writing. And he says, because of what God's given me, I've laid a foundation for you for this church in Corinth like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. So what he's talking about there is Paul comes and he starts a church. He lays the foundation. And now there's other workers, other apostles, other, other pastors who are coming and building on this foundation in this church. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. That is for us, church, especially us leaders. Whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. The foundation has to be Jesus Christ. It cannot be anything or anyone else. Verse 12, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. You guys catching this? And, and, and I want to highlight too, in case you aren't reading um, or, or part of this, you haven't gotten to this part yet. John highlights the fact that Paul is not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. There will be a judgment day even for believers. And, and our work, the work that we do in this life will be revealed on that day. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. 
Like I said, when I get there, I don't want to just be barely escaping through a wall of flames with everything going, oh man, I wasted this life. The foundation is Jesus alone. Every other foundation is faulty. (coughs) And I want to ask today, what kind of work have you built? Are you building? What kind of work, what kind of building are you creating with your life? Many of you guys have heard about um, many years ago, there was a whole bunch of homes over in Thousand Oaks where the, um, the contractor would set down the foundation and put the rebar in, and when they would come and check, I don't know a lot about this, so I'll ask my architect um, brother and sister, but uh, they, he would, in order for the inspections, he would set down the rebar, and then after they did the inspection, he would come and he'd remove it quickly at night, and then he'd lay the foundation in order to cut costs. And so the foundation was laid without the rebar. And what ended up happening is it was figured out. (laughs) Why? Because an unstable, faulty foundation will affect the whole house. And people, the value of these houses dropped significantly because what do you do when the foundation, like it it costs almost as much to rebuild a house, I think, as to to fix a faulty foundation. We have a wall over here (coughs) where same thing happened. The wall was built with bricks. And you guys know like bricks, cement, they're solid. You put that up and you're like, yeah, it's solid. But this wall was built without the rebar in it. So it got tapped by a couple cars. And now it's falling apart because it can't stay up because it doesn't have the rebar in it. It doesn't have the strength. The same thing is true when we build on anything other than Jesus. The whole foundation will be faulty and nothing will stand. It might look okay for a few years, but it will fall apart. You guys, what we do in this life matters. I'm going to be honest. Even as I was preparing this message, I was like, God, I don't like these kind of messages. I don't like these messages where I have to come up and be all like fiery. And like, I like the messages where I'm like, hey, you have such, such great value to Jesus because you do. I like the messages where I get to come and be like, you're a saint. You're no longer a sinner. You're a saint because that's how God sees you. He sees you with the righteousness of Christ because that's true. I love the messages where where I'm getting to share with you the love and the forgiveness of Jesus because that's true. But this is true too. This is true too. What we do in this life matters. Your everyday decisions matter. I'll be honest with you. It's, I've been so convicted, even in just the way that I sometimes, when I'm under stress, the way that I talk to Cody, I've been so convicted, like, that mattered. I don't want, I don't want all of that time to be burned up. I want God to be going that even when you are under stress, you are honoring and loving to the people around you. Every decision we make matters, and it will be revealed by fire. The choices you make matter. We have to tell each other. We have to remind each other of these hard truths. You don't get a free pass to live how you want to live and just make it up. You don't get to make up your own rules. It matters if you do or you don't make time for him. It matters if you choose to honor and to obey Jesus. This is why at Limitless, we are constantly talking about advancing the kingdom and changing the world and and, and transforming our city because we recognize that we could choose and many churches choose to sit in our pews or our cozy, comfy chairs and just hear knowledge and feel good and say a little prayer and go home going, I know where I'm going for eternity. But this proves to us that what we do with this life matters, and it matters not only for us, but it matters for those around us too. It matters for our city. It matters for people who who are literally dying without knowing Jesus, without knowing where they're going. Uh, What we do, the decisions we make in this life, they matter. We are called to take his presence and his power into the world. We are not just called to be good people. We are called to actually go and show signs and wonders of who he is. 
This is our call. This is our mandate. We are supposed to be the ones who carry him into the world. I don't know why he chose to do it that way. If I were him, I probably wouldn't have. Probably would have figured out a more reliable way. But for whatever reason, he said, I want you, my people, my children, as broken as you might be, to go and carry my glory, my presence, my truth into the world. Are you guys with me? Yeah? Yeah? I know these things are hard, but you guys, this is so important. We could choose to just kind of fluff each other up all the time, but the truth is this matters for your eternity and it matters for your life right now too. I started thinking, you know, as, as I was just really diving into this this week, and this is the thing that God really highlighted to me, and I started thinking about this fact that we're meant to be, to carry God's presence and that, that those are the things that will be revealed, is what did you do with my presence? Did you hide it or did you take it? And with that, I started thinking about um, this. There's quite a few scriptures, probably uh, maybe four or five, I don't know, maybe more, that talk about how we are actually God's vessels. We are like jars of clay with a treasure that we get to take out into the world. And so I want to read to you guys just one of those scriptures. It's in Isaiah 64, 4 through 8. Now, I want you to, to remember that Isaiah is an old covenant prophet in the Old Testament. And so the covenant that these people, Israelites, were under at the time is not the covenant that we're in now. So when you hear about how God is angry with them, do you think God sometimes gets frustrated with us and our lack of, you know, doing what he says? Yeah, (laughs) he still has emotion, (laughs) But this is the amazing thing. They were under a covenant of blessings and curses that where they didn't do the right things. They had actually chosen if we do the wrong things, then curses call, are called upon us. But when we do the right thing, then blessing is. We are no longer under that covenant. We are under the covenant of love through Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Because it means that we're actually in that covenant just through relationship with him, just through saying yes to Jesus, and that even when we mess up, we are still the righteousness of Christ, and those things, the mess ups will be burned away, but we actually get this opportunity to stay in him. So I just want to remind you of that and so you don't get mixed up in, in any con- um, condemnation that is not for us. All right, verse 4, Isaiah 64, verse 4. For since the world began, you guys, are you here? Like, this is so powerful. I want to make sure everyone's like fully awake, not distracted, not feeling condemned, like all that go right now. Listen to this word. (laughs) For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you. Catch this. Who works for those who wait for him. The God of the universe works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been, now this is to the Israelites, you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? That's still true. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we, when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Yet no one calls your name on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you have turned away from us and, to, and have turned us over to our sins. I know I was talking about the Old Covenant, but I do want to remind you that Romans 1 actually talks about the same thing. That if you choose to step into your sin... If you choose to walk in sin and make up excuses, he will actually give you over to your sin. It's a warning. In verse 8, this is where we're really going. And yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hands. We are the clay, and he is the potter. He gets to form our lives. And sometimes when we spend so much time questioning why we are the way that we are or why we're in this family the way that, you know, this family that that you might not have ever chosen or why this or why that, just remember he is the potter and we are the clay. He gets to form us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 
says, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we, are, I, ugh, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. You see, we are meant to be the ones who, who like jars, get to carry the treasure to the world. When we, when we lay the foundation that is Jesus Christ, we are the ones who actually get to carry his glory and his treasure and his presence and his power and his peace. And we get to shift atmospheres and we get to shift people's perspectives and we get to change belief systems and we get to carry these things. We are made by his hands to carry his glory and his presence and his power. But sometimes the world comes and pain comes and we get a divorce or we go into bankruptcy or we get betrayed by a friend or that business deal falls through or sickness comes or somebody slanders us or the dreams that we had fall apart. And, and, and many of us, because we love him, we try to pick up the pieces of our lives. And we, we, we try to just, okay, let me just get to the finish line. Let me just get to the finish line. And, and the truth is that God comes with all of his glory. And we, we are trying so hard to catch his glory and, and, and catch what he's doing in the world. And the truth is, though, that when we are so broken... We can't actually contain, we can't actually carry his goodness to the world because most of the time, we're just trying to get through. We're just trying to survive. Where's my paper towels? <laughs> Broken pieces can't catch what he has for us to give the world. And this is not condemning. This is not condemning at all because he has the solution. <laughs> And this is why our church is constantly going out after when you feel broken, when you are broken, go to him for healing. Yeah. But many of us just go, no, there's too much work to do. I just have to go. I just have to rush to the finish line as, as, as much as I can. I, I need to do as much as I can. But we're not actually able to contain all that he has for us. Too many believers are broken and content to stay that way. Not because they want to, but because it's really hard to heal. Or they don't know how to heal. Or they don't know that they can. Or they're just waiting to die, because then in heaven there will be no more tears and no more brokenness, right? But do you know that then you've made death your savior? If you're waiting, if you're waiting to die to get to heaven for all of this to be put back together, then death is your savior and Jesus is not. Because he went to the cross for your healing. He went to the cross for your wholeness. He went to the cross for your family, for your children. Right? <laughs> Many of us struggle to do anything that will last for eternity because we're just trying to get through the day. And I've had those days. Believe me. There is no condemnation in this. But I hope you find the hope in it. Then there are others of us that you know maybe these really hard things haven't happened. You haven't gone through a divorce. You haven't gone to you know, bankruptcy. You haven't fallen into you know, really, really hard times. And, and the truth is that you go around and you look like you're doing great. You've made a life for yourself. Everything's looking good. You've made a decision for Jesus and you're, you're ready to go. And so Jesus comes and you're trying to do these good deeds and... and What you don't realize is there's cracks in the foundation. Sandy was sharing with us um, at our Limitless Academy. We had a Limitless Academy teachers meeting, and she's going to share some more of this, so really encourage you to, to sign up for Breaking Beliefs. But she was sharing with us the fact that our belief systems are formed at a really young age. Do you know that 50, and this is all from Sandy, that 50% of your belief systems are formed by the time you are four years old. I have a four-year-old. 
she can't go to the bathroom alone. She wants me to go with her every time. <laughs> but 50% of her belief systems are already formed. Another 30% by the time you're nine, and another 15% by the time you're 18. So by the time you're 18, 95% of your core beliefs are formed. And some of us have managed to make a decent life for ourselves. But the truth is that when you were four, you were told that you weren't enough. When you were four, your parents maybe told you they loved you, but they really weren't there for you. Maybe when you were eight, some kid was super mean to you and bullied you, and it made you believe you were not worth it. Made you believe you couldn't learn anything because you weren't smart enough because some teacher told you that. And many of us walk around as adults with these wrong belief systems that are so at the core of who we are, and they literally affect every decision that we make, and they literally affect our ability to carry God's presence and power into the world because we're believing wrong. And when you're believing wrong, you can't, he can't teach truth, right? We can teach, I don't want to like make it sound like we can't do anything good. Of course we can. Of course we can lead people to Jesus and all of that. But when we are stuck in these belief systems that are wrong about who we are and about who God is, then we're actually just leaking his glory and his goodness. And we don't actually get to live. Can you guys imagine what it would be like if we all lived in, in the Pentecost style power of God, the awe, the reverence that we could actually walk out and with signs and wonders demonstrate the goodness of God to a dying world. We need to be healed. We need to be equipped to know what he has for us. Cody was sharing um, on our Wednesday night series about equipping, that the word equipping means um, to, to bring into alignment, right? It's like the idea of like, um, like a chiropractor has to adjust, like bring adjustment to bring you back into alignment. That's what it is to be equipped. It's to be aligned with his truth. But a lot of us avoid this healing process because it sounds really painful. Because it's true. It's, it's painful to go back and look at the things that we're believing wrong. It's painful to look at our pasts and go, okay, what is it that that taught me that was wrong? That is painful. But there is something right now. Normally, I'm the kind of person who just avoids any kind of pain, especially physical pain. But... There's been something lately, I think it was, it was shared in the, in the Awe of God study, but also this last week, Seth Dahl shared with us, and he was talking about how actually we need pain in order to grow. How many of you guys have ever been to the, to the gym? You know that. You need pain in order to grow. And some of us with the first sign of pain are like, well, that was a dumb idea. Let's not ever do that again. <laughs> but the truth is we need, I think about like my kids, my, uh, my daughter, Kayla, She's got this thing, and we're trying to work with her to develop a growth mindset, but she's got this thing where if anything is hard, she's like, I don't want to do it. School's hard. I don't want to do it. I went to it. You know, she got moved up in gymnastics to a higher, higher level, and like the first week, she's like, I want to go back to the other level because in this level, they make you try to, you know, do this flip, and I can't do it, so I want to go back to the other level. <laughs> and we're like, no, no, no. Like, you need, you need that pain. You need to be stretched. We need this. We need to be able to take our broken pieces to Jesus and go, will you make something that can hold your glory? Will you make something out of me? Will you put back together the pieces? And his answer will always be yes. I think too about pain. Um, <coughs> one of my primary love languages, if you guys know the love languages, uh, one of my primary ways to show love, love to people I love is giving gifts. This has turned out to be a really difficult thing as a parent because I just want to give my kids everything. Right, Cody? I'm just like, oh, you want that? Yes. You will not know that I love you if I do not buy for you the American Girl doll pet pig that actually makes snorting noises. How could you possibly know that I love you if I don't get this for you? Right? And so I've had this thing of like, oh, I'm having to actually me go through pain going, I need to show you other ways of loving you because if I get you everything you want, you will become a spoiled brat. And it's painful for my kids because they're going, but mom, I want it. Why don't you love me? Right? And that's painful, but they don't realize that that pain of not getting everything they want right now actually is what helps them to develop into the kind of people who will actually have character and not be entitled. Pain is for a purpose. 
We are afraid of pain, so we avoid healing because we know that it means facing that pain. And I'm going to be honest. I honestly believe that it's better to be this broken than this broken. Because this way, you can actually walk around feeling like things are okay. But this broken, you know you're not okay. And I've seen people who come in this broken, and they go after it. They go after everything that Jesus has because they know they need him. And it is so beautiful. But many of us, when we look at this, we go, there is nothing I can do with this. I just need to start over. My life is so broken. I just need to start over. I'm sure you guys have all heard of King Sugi which is a Japanese art. You may not have heard that word, but it's a, it's a Japanese art form where wherever something like this is broken, like if something like this broke in our house, Cody and I would just be like, well, that's in the trash. But what, what the Japanese discovered is actually if you take these broken pottery pieces and you put it together using gold, you're actually able to make something really beautiful. Now, obviously, this is just you know gold dust. It's not real gold. But what you have to realize is when you have a broken jar and you put it together with with actual gold, is that jar going to be now more valuable broken than it was before it was broken? And that is what happens when Jesus comes into our lives and heals us. We are more more valuable. (coughs) We are more valuable not to him. We're never more. There's never a time where you can be more valuable to him. You just already are but we are more valuable to the world. We are more valuable to the lost and the broken when we are broken but healed by the king. We need to put ourselves into his hands for healing. We are formed in his hands, but we need to be reformed into healed vessels for his glory. You know, I was, uh, God kind of gave me this, this illustration that kept building all week. And so I actually went and I, I, I was trying to look at like ready-made jars like this and I couldn't find them anywhere. But I found this kit where you can actually do it yourself. And so I was like, this is awesome. All right, I'm gonna, I was hoping to be able to actually do it on the stage, but it just is really difficult. So um, I just decided to go, I, before I realized that, I, I started to put together, um, I broke this piece of, of pottery and I started to try to put it together and I was in there I think it was super early Friday morning and I like I have all these broken pieces like this and I'm taking the the adhesive with the gold in it and I'm like trying to do it and I didn't realize how fast it it actually dries and so I'm trying to you know stick this piece together and by myself it didn't turn out so pretty Uh, You can't really see it from back there, but there are pieces that are sticking out, and I've got, like, gold stuff everywhere. And as I'm doing this, God just kind of laughs with me, and he's like, you're trying to heal by yourself, and that doesn't work. So many of us, when we see our brokenness, we go, let me go hide this in the corner, and me and Jesus will fix it. And yes, he's the only one who can put me together, but I don't want anyone to see my brokenness, so I'm going to go heal over here. This might look functional from far away, and it might even somewhat be pretty, but the truth is it has cracks all over, and it will leak. And the truth is that when we choose to go away and isolate ourselves and not invite others in, not invite others to pray for us when we're sick, not invite others in when we're feeling broken, when we're falling into sin, whatever it is, We are not going to be able to be put together because God actually says to us, he's the only one who can heal us, but we're called to carry each other's burdens. And as I'm trying to do this, I realized I needed Cody's help. And so later, Cody and I did this one. Isn't it so much more pretty? Because Cody was holding it. We need other people to hold us when we're healing. Because sometimes we can't hold ourselves up. And I realized that I needed help instead of trying to do it quietly and quickly on my own. (laughs) And some of the pieces when I was doing it on my own, I I didn't realize that they were kind of out of order, and so I couldn't quite get this one in. And suddenly I'm like trying to do it and trying to to stick it in there, and I'm like, there's some red on this jar. (laughs) 
oh, <laughs> I was trying so hard to push the peace into place that I cut myself. And pain came, <laughs> but not the good kind of pain that God uses. It's the kind of pain when we try to force things our, our, on our own or in our own timing instead of allowing God to come in and be part of the process and tell us when it's time. And sometimes things have an order. And sometimes he goes, hey, I'm going to work on the foundation first, and I know you're not going to like some of the jagged pieces that are left, but I actually need it to go in a certain order because you're not quite ready for all of it yet. But we have to constantly be taking it back to him and go, Jesus, what is it? Because I don't see the whole picture. God, what is it? What is the next step? What do I need? Do I need somebody to pray for me? Do I need to, you know, go through a, a, a recovery, in some sort of recovery? Is there parts of my belief system that are wrong? What is it? This is the process of sanctification. This is not new to Limitless Church. <laughs> This is what Jesus actually set up is that we are saved and then we are sanctified, becoming more like him, bringing our soul, our heart, our thoughts, our mind, our body, everything into alignment with what he says about us. We need to take time because I hurt myself trying to push it in my own because I was like, I must get this done. <laughs> Instead of just waiting and asking for help. We need to do things in God's timing, and we need to do them as a process. Cody and I spent a week in um, Cabo last week. Thank you so much to everybody who helped us get there. It was amazing um, for my birthday, and <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I'm choking. Um, and so we got there, but we actually were delayed a day because there was a hurricane. And um, like right, right where we were going or near where we were going. So we were delayed a day. We got there the next day. And for the first few days, we couldn't actually go down to the beach um, because the hurricane had really kind of messed things up. And um, they have these really cool like cemented in um, like what is that umbrella type shade things. And a lot of them were on the ground and had been pulled up out of the, you know, it, it was just kind of a disaster. And um, they wouldn't let us down there at first. And then we started noticing that some of the workers were taking wheelbarrows to move sand from up here back down to where it was supposed to be. And one of the people who had been there during the hurricane said, oh, wow, like the, the beach looks so different because a lot of where we were, it was just rock. And they're like, no, it was all sand before. And the hurricane just pushed all the sand up into the wrong places. So they literally, the resort is sending workers. And I'm looking at this going, one guy with a wheelbarrow? Come on now. But it was amazing because about three days later, there were a few more guys with wheelbarrows, and they had started to really make a massive impact. And, and God just spoke to me, and he said, sometimes things look too slow for you, and it looks impossible. But if you will just take it one pain at a time, one belief system at a time, one getting out of sin at a time, one choice, one decision at a time, suddenly you'll discover that the landscape of your life has changed. I know this is kind of gross, but as I was looking down at the blood that was now mixed in to the gold, Jesus said to me, if I hadn't poured out my blood, there would be no healing. There would never be a brokenness that could be fixed. The reality is that he has done it all, and sometimes we may not understand. We may not understand what's going on. We may, not, we may look at the world and go, God, what are you doing? We may look at our lives and go, God, what are you doing? And we might start to think, you know, I can do things my own way. I can make my own choices. I can... You know, I can make decisions that will be good for me and, and it'll be okay. But the truth is that we actually don't have a right to question what God is doing. He lets us because he's good. He lets us question. But the truth is that he knows what he's doing. The truth is that he's promised that there is healing for us and there is freedom. But he has also to told us that this life is but a vapor. And when we endure the hard things in this life and keep our eyes fixed on him anyway, we might discover that as we enter the gates, he has cities for us. I want to close with 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 and 21. 
Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. I want to remind you that sometimes the hammer that breaks us is not other people. It's not life circumstances. It's not bankruptcy. It's not all those things. Sometimes we pick up the hammer and we choose to walk in ways that do not honor him. And the consequences will be brokenness. And even in those moments, even when you took the hammer to yourself, he is still willing to come and fix, to mend, and to put you together in a way that will make you more valuable than you can possibly imagine, as you're actually able to then go and take his goodness and his glory and pour out until it's overflowing, pour out until we, we literally are able to just give people a glimpse of who he is, how good he is. I'm not going to try to make that clean. <laughs> We are literally able to just pour out with our, with our kindness, with our love, with our good deeds, with our good work, with our good decisions. We are able to take his glory into the world. We're able to take his peace when we go, you know what, I understand what it feels like to be in the middle of trials and tragedy and struggle. I understand what that feels like. But my God... My God, he is there and he will supply every, supply every need of yours. My God is able to, ta- to make beauty from ashes. The reality is what we do in this life matters. What we do in this life matters. And it actually says there in that verse I just read, it says, you get to cleanse yourself from what is dishonorable and become a vessel that is used for honorable things, that is set apart as holy and useful to your master, useful to the house and ready for every good work. God, we just want to ask you today, Will you step into our lives, God? If there are any broken parts of us, God, whether other people broke us or whether we broke ourselves, God, if there are any broken pieces, will you pick up and show us what are the things that you want to bring healing to today? What are the areas that you want to comfort us in today, God? Lord, if there are any things that we are doing right now, God, that are actually making us dishonorable. Will you reveal those things to us, God? And without condemnation, God, I ask that you would come and you would push us into repentance, God. Each one of us, God, if, even if it's, if it's the way that we talk to the person at the grocery store, God, if it's whatever it is, whether it's massive or tiny, it's all the same to you. It's all the same to you because all you see is our hearts. God, will you make our hearts pure vessels for you to carry this treasure that you've given us into the world? God, will you show us the good works that you have prepared for us to do? And God, without condemnation, will you help us to see that the decisions we make in this life matter for eternity? They matter for the people around us. They matter for our children. They matter for our city. The things that are done in secret, God, matter in eternity. Lord, will you please make us vessels that are honorable to bring your peace, your presence, and your power into the world, God. You are so good. You are so worthy of everything that we have to offer. God, I specifically want to pray for anyone who right now is just going through the fight of their lives. They're just struggling. Things are hard. News is bad. God, will you help them? God, will you bring healing? Will you bring your peace and your presence into their lives, into their situations? And God, through this trial, will you help them to keep their eyes fixed on you?
I just want to invite any of you as we go into this last song. If you need prayer, will you come up? We'll have our prayer um, team over to the side here. But if you want to just come worship, if you just need to get on your knees, get on your face before God, if there's something you need to bring to the altar to, to repent of, if there's something that you need to bring to the altar that is so broken and you don't know what to do with it, will you just come and, and bring it before the king who has everything that you need for your healing?